isn't it good to be in church? Amen. It's a song that's going to go along with the message this morning. Only a sinner saved by grace. How many of you know this song? How many most of you? Oh, good, about half of you. All right, the rest of you, we can learn it. Amen. Not have I gotten, but what I have received. I'm only a sinner saved by grace. This is Jason Murphy's life song. Right. Only a sinner saved by grace. On the first, not have I gotten. Not have I gotten, but what I received. Grace has bestowed it since I have believed. Because y'all know the song, it's called Victory in Jesus and uh, Lopez style. And so uh, <laughs> you hope you'd sing along. Hey Amen. Thank you, Lord. I just want to praise God this morning that we can get together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, I want to praise God that we can worship. He allows us, He gives us the grace to worship Him and um, this song and any music because, um, well, there was a time when I couldn't sing songs um, of the Lord but through his grace amen and this song here victory in Jesus says it all amen. Amen. I 
I heard an old, old story How Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning And his precious blood's atoning then I repented of my sin and won a victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. All my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing and his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He saw me. With his redeeming blood, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Play it, brother, play it. Amen. Work it, David, work it. Sorry, folks. Third verse. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old redemption story. Sing of them the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me. All my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing
Okay, let's all stand. Thank you very much. Brother George, I thought it was my job to put people on the spot. <laughs> all right, let's all stand. Years I spent in vanity and pride. <laughs> at Calvary, at Calvary, on the first. Let's sing it out. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not, my Lord was crucified. No, we thought it was for me. He died. I gets any bigger, then we're going to have to extend the stage or kick out a wall behind us. So we praise God for that, that it, the choir continues to grow and do a good job. All right, I'd like everybody to reach forward in the pew in front of them, if they would, and grab the open door response card. And uh, we're just going to fill out the front of this card together, and then uh, you're going to hang on to this, and Pastor Blue is going to refer to it at the end of the service. Today's date is the 30th of October. And if you want to put your name down there, and if we don't have your address already, whether or not you're first, second, or third time visitor, an attender, or a member, and then on the right-hand side, your age group, and whether you're single or married. And as I mentioned, just hang on to this card, and Pastor Blue will refer to it at the end of the service. Pastor. Thank you, Jesus. Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the book of Matthew, and I think it's chapter 10. And uh, while we're doing that, uh, let me just mention that, uh, of course, tonight at 6 o'clock, we'll continue our studies in the book of Revelation. I hope you'll be here for that. And uh, then um, next Sunday night is, uh, is a very special uh, time, especially for Mrs. Blue and myself. It'll be our 50th anniversary. And... Uh, <clears throat> Okay, enough of that. Now, why I tell you that is I want you to come. I want you to be there Sunday night after the service. Uh, we'll be, during that day, uh, in the afternoon, we'll be doing our 101 through 401 class from 3 to 7. I'll be over here. I'll teach three hours over there, and then I'll be over here uh, for the uh, study of Revelation. And then after that, we're going to go downstairs and have some time. And, and you need to come down, and uh, let me tell you just how lucky my wife is. Just how, how fortunate it is. 
and uh, the secret of actually together we've been married a hundred years so uh, so you know if you should be so fortunate so anyway we're just gonna have a good time and I, I would I'd love to have you to come down and uh, I don't know what we're gonna do mrs. Lyle's got things planned and I know it'll go well but uh, my wife and I just like to visit with you a little bit and uh, have you to join in us as we celebrate that special occasion and of course we're going to have another another event here we're I'm going to marry a couple right during the Sunday night service just going to be part of the Sunday night service and we've got a young couple that uh, they're going to be married somewhere off maybe maybe I'll uh, <coughs> fit them in there in Revelation where it says you know the bride something I don't know but uh, but you know we can just make the Bible do anything for us uh, but anyway uh, it's going to be a special Sunday night service and so I want to encourage every one of you to plan to be here and then, of course, tonight uh, uh, for the uh, study of the Revelation. Uh, here in Matthew chapter um, 10, I just want to call your attention down to verse 8, and then we'll uh, make some comments this uh, morning about the last part of that verse. Uh, here Jesus is uh, commissioning uh, his 12 disciples to go not into all the world, but only to go to the Jews within the land of Israel, at that time, and then of course to go into Jerusalem, Judea, and the, the uttermost part of the earth. But notice uh, in verse 8, he said, Heal the sick, <clears throat> cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Now, uh, evangelists and preachers are not doing this today. This was a Jewish commission, and uh, nobody's raising the dead. A lot of folks are raising the devil, but uh, nobody's raising the dead. Uh, nobody is uh, doing these things in spite of faith healers and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you're being hoodwinked if you think that's happening. Uh, this commission is a kingdom uh, commission that the Lord gave to the disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And they were signs uh, of our Lord's deity, which were prophesied through the Old Testament. And so it's another thing. But I want you to look at the last part of that verse. He said, uh, he said, freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. And uh, today uh, we're going to continue our studies of this subject of grace. We've been talking about it now for the last pi uh, six weeks. And uh, the first message I preached on was on saving grace how we are saved by grace through faith plus nothing. And that is the starting point. If you don't start there, uh, you have bypassed the most important thing. So you have to start there. And I'm hoping that before we dismiss this service today that some of you will make a decision to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior if you haven't done that. And then beyond that, of course, is sustaining grace. You know, God keeps you by the same grace that saves you. Uh, if you had to keep yourself, you would have been lost a long time ago. So it is God's grace that keeps us. And we need to understand that grace. The Bible said, He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus, or till the rapture and the second advent. And then we talked about healing grace. We talked about the grace that heals our hurts and the wounds that we have received down through life. Some of you are carrying uh, a wounded spirit and bitterness and anger things that happened to you in your childhood and uh, and so on and you those uh, those wounds and hurts are really worse than physical uh, injuries and we talked about that we talked about liberating grace how that God sets us free and how we can be set free and that was the last message I talked about and today I really want to talk to you about forgiving grace or we call it giving grace because the Lord said you have received freely and you ought to give the same way You've received God's uh, forgiveness. You've received God's grace in your life. And uh, you need to, and you've got it freely, and so you ought to give it the same way. Most of the time in our churches, we talk about grace only in one context. And we talk about it in salvation. We always refer to grace, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. And that is true, but we talk about it only in that context where folks think that's the only time grace is extended or that grace is to be extended. And so we're going to talk about that. Really, God says what you get, you should pass on. You got salvation, God gave it to you. Well, certainly you're to pass it on to others. And you got saved, you're to try to get others saved. But also, you've had God's grace in your life and other areas. And likewise, you should pass that on. You should extend it to others. 
And that is so important, and that's what we're going to talk about. You know you've been blessed by God. He expects you to bless others. Uh, we talk about our comfort over there in 1 Corinthians. And God said we're to comfort others with the same comfort that we are comforted with. We pass it on, and so the same thing is true in this matter of God's grace. You've been forgiven. God wants you to forgive others. Uh, you've been blessed. God wants you to bless others. Here in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8, it said, Freely you have received, freely give. And so we want to talk about the, this matter of forgiveness uh, because, you know what, we need it more than anything else. As I think of the things that I need, there's nothing I need more than forgiveness. Uh, and so we need God's uh, forgiveness. We need the forgiveness of others. And certainly we need to forgive others. We live in a society today that, you know, there seems to be this theme of forgiveness. You hear it all the time. You see it in the headlines, people talking about it. But the problem is, I think, that it cheapens grace and forgiveness the way it is promoted in society and from television. You know, we talk about the scandal at the White House and everybody's forgiving the president, regardless of who he is. And then we've got Saddam Hussein, you know, and his atrocities, and everybody's in the forgiving mood. And, uh, you know, and it really cheapens it. It cheapens grace. You know, there's just a lot of shoddy forgiveness going on today, a lot of myths, a lot of misconception about what forgiveness is. And so I hope we can clear that up today. And uh, when it comes to forgiveness, you know, people water it down. And our society, I think, is, 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 ha has an epidemic of cheap grace because they don't understand grace. And of course it's splashed over into the church and really it's an abuse of grace. And it's really making, you know what it does, it makes uh, forgiveness apply to things that don't even apply to you. And uh, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about that. I think we're afraid that people will feel guilty. And so we want to forgive them right up front so they don't feel bad. You know, you ought to feel guilty if you're guilty. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with feeling sorry for your sins. There's nothing wrong with feeling guilty, if you are guilty. And so I've tried to say, you ought not to feel guilty if you're not guilty. Some people just feel guilty for living. And the sad part about it, there are people who are actually commit crimes, and they have no sense of guilt. And that is a serious problem. So we need to get those things balanced out. We need to sort them out to know what's real and what's not real. And so we're going to talk about that today, you know, but really, everybody's you know, forgiven, uh, you know. Uh, we want to talk about what is really forgiveness. I've got a little test here, a little quiz. Uh, you may have it on your handout sheet, and we'll see how you do. And, uh, you know, there's really, you know, you're not going to be flunked if you, if you get the right answer. In fact, you can cross it out and put the other. Let me give you a little test here. Number one, a person, a person should not be forgiven until he asks for it. Don't say anything. Just write down the circle your answer, true or false. Number two, forgiveness includes minimizing the offense and minimizing the pain it causes. Number two, true or false. Number three, forgiveness includes res uh, restoring trust and, you re and reuniting a relationship. True or false. Number four, you don't have to really forgive until you, you I'm sorry, you haven't really forgiven until you've forgotten the offense. True or false. And then number five, when, it, when, it, when I see someone else hurt, it is my duty to forgive the offender, true or false. Now, <clears throat> I have no idea what you, what you, how many of you got true for all of them? How many of you got false for all of them? How many of you got some true, some false? How many of you did nothing, played it safe? <laughs> Forget it, I don't want to know. Okay. That's the way to do it. You can't be wrong if you don't do anything. That's, that's kind of the way. Now, listen, if you and I were to take the Word of God and go through the Gospels and through the, see the life of Jesus Christ and His action, I think your conclusion would be that all five of these statements are false. All five of them are false. And uh, so we're going to look at forgiveness today as to what it really is and what it isn't. And first thing about forgiveness, what it is not, uh, it is not conditional. Forgiveness is not conditional. It is not based on some condition. And in fact, the Bible says right the opposite. The Bible says that real, genuine forgiveness is unconditional. And uh, it's not something you earn. You can't earn it. 
It is not something you deserve. You don't deserve forgiveness. Uh, it is not something you buy or bargain for. You don't promise God, if you'll forgive me, I'll never do it again. First of all, that won't work, and you will do it again. So that's not what forgiveness is. And uh, so you don't, uh, you, know, you don't give some kind of a bargain or get a part of a bargain uh, if you promise never to do it again. It's unconditional. Uh, if you tell a person, I'll forgive you if, that's not forgiveness. And you need to understand that because there are people that really believe that. I'll forgive you if. That is not forgiveness. That is not biblical forgiveness. It's not real forgiveness. So when Jesus hung on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was not conditional. He, he asked God to forgive them. He was willing. He himself was willing to forgive them. And, uh, he, and so at that point, nobody was asking for forgiveness. Nobody deserved it. And nobody had bargained or bartered for it. It was, unconditional. it was an unconditional offer of pardon. They just had to repent and accept it, and it would have been theirs. Number two, uh, it isn't minimizing the seriousness of the offense. Real forgiveness is not, does not minimize the seriousness of the offense. That, you know, you, that's not what forgiveness is, minimizing. Say, oh, it, really, it really is nothing. You know, it's, it's, it's okay. It, it doesn't amount to anything. Well, if it's nothing and doesn't amount to anything, it doesn't need forgiveness anyway. See, real hurt and real offenses need real forgiveness. But if it really didn't hurt and it really was not important, then it really doesn't need forgiveness, does it? Why? How could you forgive somebody for something that's nothing? So it, it, it doesn't minimize the seriousness of it, you know. And uh, so you don't tell people, don't worry about it. It's okay to tell people. I tell you what, it really did hurt. What you said really did hurt me. And it's okay to say that. You're not attacking the person. Right. You know, I was really offended by what you said and what you did, you say. Or, you know, some kind of a physical injury. You don't minimize it. Uh, and, uh, and so, or you don't minimize it when you talk about forgiveness. So you have to understand this, that, that real forgiveness isn't minimizing the seriousness of the offense. Not only that, forgiveness needs to be reserved for the big, you know, that we have the idea that it has to be, you know, reserved for the big stuff. And then let me move on down to number three. Forgiveness is not uh, uh, resuming a right relationship without change. Forgiveness is not continuing a relationship without a person changing because these are two different things one is forgiveness the other one is relationship they are not the same things okay so it's important that we understand that forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation they are two different there are two things that are absolutely different and folks have the idea sometimes if you forgive somebody the relationship has to be restored and it should be done instantly. And it doesn't. You do not have to reconcile with somebody or restore a relationship if they're forgiven. And if you do restore a relationship and reconcile with them, it may be a long process. They're not the same thing. Forgiveness is instantaneously. But restoration and relationships may take a long time. One is hurt, it needs to be healed. But the other one is just a decision you make to forgive the person. So they're not the same thing, and I think it's really important. You know, forgiveness simply takes, you know, takes care of the damage, and it's letting the person off the hook. But that doesn't mean there has to be, you know, if a guy steals money from you and he apologizes and forgives and, you, and asks you to forgive him, you can forgive him, but you don't have to give him his job back. And you'll hear guys say, well, if you forgive me, you forget, you know, and you give, that is nonsense. That's nonsense. That is not forgiveness. So they're two different things. Forgiveness means you no longer hold the person responsible for that act. You're not going to continue to hold it over their head. And so there are some other things you know that, you know, if you want to have a restored relationship with someone, you know, first comes forgiveness. And that is your part. You've been hurt. But they also have a part to do as well if there's going, to be, there's going to be reconciliation and restitution. There has to be repentance. 
If there's going to be a relationship, there has to be repentance. There has to, you can forgive a person, but they have to change if you're going to trust them. Do you understand what I'm saying? If a guy loaned me a thousand bucks and couldn't and wouldn't pay it back and said, but forgive me, I'm, I'm obligated to forgive him. But I'm not obligated to loan him another thousand. If your husband or wife is unfaithful to you and asks you to forgive them, you are obligated to forgive them. You're not obligated to take them back. Now, I think it's better if you can, if that relationship can be restored and, and things can be like they ought to be. I think, it's, I think it's the best thing. But the Lord Jesus all, leaves an out in situations like that. See? And so there's a world of difference. Forgiveness is first. Reconciliation follows that when there's repentance. That's why when some men or women will say, well, I don't understand why you can't trust me. I've asked for forgiveness and you've forgiven me. Trust is another issue. I could call up Sears and say, I owe you $1,000. I can't pay it. They say, no problem, Mr. Blue. We'll forgive the debt. Don't try it. It won't work. But you know what? I say, well, good. Would you send me my new credit card? They're not sending it. You see, they're not sending it. They just forgave me the debt. They didn't forget. <laughs> and that's another issue that some of you have. You think that forgiveness means forgetting. And personally, you can't forget. There's no way you can forget. You can't forget injuries that people do to you. You can't forget lies people tell about you. And you shouldn't hold yourself guilty because you still remember those things because forgiveness and remembering are two different things. They're not the same. But you'll hear all the time, you know, well, we, we got to forgive and forget. Well, that's okay, but you can't forget. You know, they don't understand that. And, uh, and so we'll talk about the way you do that. But let me say again that forgiveness is my right when it wasn't. Forgiveness isn't my right when I wasn't the one that was hurt. Forgiveness isn't my right when I wasn't the one who was hurt. And I think this is the act, exact opposite of our culture today. We see things today that are disgusting when it comes to this matter of forgiveness. And you have to understand that only the victim can pronounce forgiveness uh, to the person who has offended them. So if you weren't hurt, it's not your place to proclaim forgiveness. Amen. You need to keep your mouth shut because it's an insult. Could you imagine the Pope, and he did, telling the Jews that he forgave them for killing Jesus Christ? What an insult. The Pope forgiving them? You would have to put yourself in the place of God to believe that you could forgive a, a nation for crucifying Christ. Why? That's, that's an insult, among other things. Why, when Timothy McVeigh blew up the building in Oklahoma and killed and so many people and injured and left parents without their children and children without their parents and husbands without their wives and so on, a guy was standing on the street with a sign saying, Timothy, I forgive you and so should others. What a slap in the face. Right. Amen. You, I can't forgive somebody else for abusing you. Say. And we've got this thing going on in society today. You know, a little, a little girl gets abducted and she's raped, and you know, and the, pa fa the family's going insane, and they are just worried to death and all of this. And, and somebody else telling the rapist, I forgive you. Somebody ought to, you know, in love, ought to slap them right upside the head. <laughs> that is stupidity. And what an insult to the damaged family, you see. Forgiveness and healing take time. Grief takes time. You understand? People have to go through a grief process. And you don't go into denial about grief. It is a process. It's a circle. Some people bottom out instantly. Sometimes it takes people years to go through this, this grief cycle. That's why a lot of folks, they, you know, two people get divorced, they meet in a tavern, they're hurting, and they get married. Three months later, they say, what have we done? 
See, the marriage was only based on both of them were grieving. It wasn't based on friendship, relationship, or anything else. And then they find out they made a serious mistake. You have to go through. That's why, in my opinion, you ought not, if you've gone through a divorce or the loss of a loved one, you ought not to get married the next time around until you've gone through this grief cycle so you can think clearly. Does that make sense to you? See? And so we're just talking about these things. Forgiveness isn't my right when I wasn't the one who was hurt. Only the victim can pronounce forgiveness to the person who offended them. You know, many people don't understand that forgiveness does not remove the consequences of sin. Forgiveness does not necessarily remove the consequences. If you use drugs as a young man or a young woman and you get saved, you probably are going to carry the consequences with you the rest of your life. You get out here and get on crack and some of this other stuff, I'm telling you, you're going to burn out your brain cells. And if you live, and then you get saved, and I'm glad you do, but the damage is already done. And people who go through that process, then they get saved and they love the Lord. But you know what? They can't even think through a problem because they've been damaged. And you get out here and you keep messing around and you're unfaithful and you're immoral and committing adultery and fornication, you can get saved and get forgiven. But that doesn't remove the AIDS possibility. You hear me? See, forgiveness doesn't necessarily take away the consequences of sin. They're two different things. A man can go to prison for murder and turn to the Lord and really get saved. <laughs> but that's not going to keep him from the chair. Nor should it. See? They're two different things. And so just keep in mind that, you know, people don't understand that forgiveness does not remove the consequences of sin. And, uh, you know, I just, you see a lot of people whose lives are, are ruined. And I wish I could impress on, on especially on our young people, that you, um, I'm telling you what, I, I sometimes... It sometimes bothers me when people who've lived a life of drugs and immorality and they get saved and they're gloriously saved and thank God for them. And then we have them to give testimonies about their background. I think it's best we don't give testimonies about our background. You understand? Because what we're saying to many people over here who are tempted, well, look at them. I can do the same thing and then get saved and so on. No, no, I wouldn't play that game. It's a dangerous game. Say. And so, uh, you know, forgiveness is not all those things. And so let me just say what forgiveness is. Real forgiveness, according to the Bible, is first of all is remembering how much you have been forgiven. It is remembering how much you have been forgiven. I want you to look at, they'll put it up behind me here, but in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, what a wonderful verse about the grace of forgiveness. And notice what he says, Be ye kind one to another. Now that's God's people. Christians ought to be kind to each other. You know, you're not a fundamentalist because you're rude or, or you're unkind to people. You ought to be kind to people. Amen. See? Even your enemies, the Bible says, you ought to be kind to them. So certainly your brothers and sisters in Christ, you ought to be kind to them. Be ye kind one to another. Notice the next verse is tender hearted. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. Look at it even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Even as. Just as God forgave you, you ought to forgive other people. And by the way, when you remember how much you have been forgiven, listen to me, it will be much easier for you to forgive other people. And people who have a hard time forgiving forget what they've been forgiven for. You forget. And we're going to talk about that, but, you know, um, Jesus came, you know, he came across, to, there was a situation in the Bible where Jesus was around a, a group of people and a woman came in and uh, she had a box, a precious little box made out of alabaster. It was full of perfume. And she broke it in order to open it and she took that perfume and uh, she began to wash his feet with that expensive perfume 
And of course, I think you know the story. Uh, they began to look and they would begin to, they knew who this woman was. They knew that she was a woman that, uh, you know, was not respected within the community. She was, uh, had low morals. And she came in and she washed our Lord's feet. And um, of course, the critics said, you know, we should have, you could have taken that and sold them sold it and given the money for the poor. That's what critics always do. They pretend they're concerned about somebody else other than Jesus Christ. Say, uh, They're not concerned about lost people. They're not concerned about the glory of Christ. You see, Judas was that kind of a guy. And uh, so they criticized. You know what Jesus said? Let her alone. Let her alone. You know why this woman did that? She'd been forgiven. And you know, Peter was told, he said, Simon was told, he that is forgiven much, loveth much. Not he who loves forgives much, but he who is forgiven much, loves much. Now some of you, God bless you, but your struggle in loving people and forgiving people is that you don't have a sense of how much you've been forgiven. That's your problem. You really are still struggling with this little idea that you are really a bad person. I'm, I know I'm bad, but not all that bad. Therefore, it really didn't take a lot of grace to save me. See? He who is forgiven much, loves much. And so we have to understand how much we've been forgiven. And when you get that straight in your mind, it'll be easy for you to forgive other people. That's just the way it works. I've told you this story. You know every story I know. I just recycle them. Sometimes I get a new one if I go visit another church, and that's why I leave every once in a while. I just get a new illustration. But I said to Brother Ruckman one time, I said, why is it that we're always having to ask forgiveness? And I love Brother Ruckman. You know, you never know where he's going to come from. And he said, well, Brother Blue, he said, all dogs have fleas just to remind them that they're, flea, that they're dogs. <laughs> So I don't care what kind of dog you are. If you're a mongrel or you're a thoroughbred or whatever you are, you still got fleas, <laughs> you see. And uh, you need God's grace. And you've, if you are saved, you've had God's grace. You have God's grace. But by all means, you should be giving that to others. Freely you have received, freely forgive or freely give. You know, not only that, but... Uh, there's this matter of relinquishing my rights to get even. I heard a fellow say, I don't get mad, I just get even. Well, that's cute, but it is unscriptural as it can be. You never have a right to get even with somebody. That is wicked. And in Romans chapter 12, I want you to look at it. I think they'll put it up here. Romans chapter 12. And uh, if you'll look down at verse 19, or look at verse 19, it says, Dearly beloved, talking to Christians, avenge not yourselves. What that means is don't get even. Don't get even. Notice it says, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Now, if somebody breaks into your house or your car it is okay to call the police. That is not vengeance. That is not getting even. That is a right thing to do. But if you know who broke into your car and you go down and break into their car, not only is that vengeance, you'll probably get arrested yourself. It is wrong to try to get even with people because that is wicked. And you see, once you start doing that, then God has to deal with you now as a sinner. He can't deal with you in grace. And that's how folks get themselves in trouble, is trying to, trying to get even with others, you know. And you may say, you know, if I forgive them, then it means I have to give up my right to get even. Well, of course it does. You don't have the right anyway. And, um, but that's what forgiveness is. You give up your right to get even, you know. And uh, people say that's unfair. Well... Uh, who said forgiveness is fair? Who said it was fair? We're not talking about fair. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a word for fairness. It's called justice. No. Yeah. See? And uh, justice is fair. Forgiveness is grace. I don't want what is fair. 
I don't want justice. Do you? I don't think you do, unless you're self-righteous and you don't know who you are. But you want grace. You want mercy. Say, uh, my, my, my daughter Lisa, back when she was a teenager, she was driving, I think it was her mother's car, come to think of it. And uh, the car in front of her was going to make a left turn. I don't know if it had a signal on. I don't know the story because when a teenager tells it, who knows? So anyway, but anyway, the car swung far to the right to make a sweeping left turn. Well, my daughter, when the car pulled to the right, she decided to pass it. And it turned right into the side of her and banged up the door. Well, the officer came, wrote a ticket, of course, and, and uh, she went to court over here in Linwood and uh, stood before the judge, you know, a lot of other people in there. That's really what you like when they say, Reverend Blue, you're next. You know, <laughs> I keep looking around and I don't see Reverend anywhere. But anyway, uh, so Lisa gets up there before the judge and she tries to tell this story. Of course, she had real pretty hair and pretty eyes and, you know, how, and, and work in all of them, you know. And, uh, but she's standing up there and she's telling about this story. And she says, Judge, the truth is it doesn't make sense to me. And the judge says, you know what? It doesn't make sense to me either. <laughs> Get out of here. Just what she wanted. <laughs> you see, that's grace. <laughs> that's grace. Praise God for grace. I thought that was a funny story. I don't, maybe I didn't tell it right. I'll tell it again. Oh, no. <laughs> ah, that laugh got you off the hook. Okay. But let me just say this, that, you know, forgiveness, really it relinquishes your rights to get even. And you need to get over that of trying to get even with people, with people in your family, with people in the church, with people you work at. That is not Christian. That's not God-like. God says, I will take care of the vengeance end of it. And by the way, He'll do a much better job than you. Because once you get through getting vengeance, then God has to deal with you. Because now, He said, vengeance is mine. So now you're on the receiving end from God. See how it works? And by the way, it's exactly what the devil wants. The devil plays everybody against each other so that everybody gets punished. So leave that dirty work to somebody else. Just leave it alone. Let me say number three is responding to evil with good. Responding to evil with good. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and 28. But I say unto you, love your enemies, do good to them that hate you, Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Look at that word, pray for them that despitefully use you. Now, you know how you can tell if you've really forgiven somebody? If you've really genuinely forgiven them? You know what it is? You can pray for them. Somebody you cannot pray for, you have not forgiven them. You are still in your heart holding them conscious. The Lord said, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. So if you cannot release somebody in your mind from the wrong they've done, you are still holding them responsible, and you haven't forgiven them. Forgiveness means you can pray for them. See, there's the real acid test of forgiveness. Say, why? What if the Lord had the attitude toward you? I can't, you know... I can't answer your prayer because I'm still upset at you. Say, when I can get over it, you come and see me. But that's the way some of you are. When I can get over it, I'll pray for those that have done me wrong. You need to forgive people. I had a fellow that worked for me. I led him to the Lord. He was a good guy. I love him. I, I've loved him since the day I led him to Christ. And uh, he was uh, part of the first fruits here at Open Door Baptist Church. He went off to Bible college. He worked here in this church for a long time as a layman. Went off to Bible college. Graduated with the highest of honors in, in, in Bible college. Top of the class. Uh, he came back and worked for me, oh, I guess, about five years. And uh, there's a misunderstanding between us. And he got, he got angry at me. Got bitter. And uh, it just went downhill. And finally I told him, I said, you know what? I would rather be your friend than your boss. And it didn't, <laughs> that comment didn't help much. And he left. He was bitter, bitter, bitter. 
And uh, I, you know what I, you know how I rationalized it. I said, I wish he'd come to me and for, ask for forgiveness so I could forgive him. You get it? I sure wish he'd come to me so I could forgive him and we could mend this relationship. That's what some of you are doing. You're putting all the responsibility on the other person. Anyway, we'll talk about that in a minute. So anyway, we had a revival meeting here with the Satara twins. Some of you will remember that. And I really got under conviction about restoring relationship with this brother. So I tried to call him, and I couldn't get through to him. And I thought, well, I, I tried. And the Holy Spirit said, oh, no, you haven't. <laughs> You're not even going to talk to him on the phone. You're going to go see him. So my wife and I got in the car. We drove down to Shelton, found his place, and didn't know where he lived, found him, drove in the driveway. He and his family were out in the, out in the yard. We hadn't seen each other in five years or more. And um, he saw me driving. He had no idea probably what I was coming to do, you know. Surprised he didn't run and get his guns. And uh, we went out and sat down at a table in the backyard, one of these picnic tables. And I said to him, I called him by name, and I said, I want you to forgive me for allowing this animosity between the two of us to go on all these years. And he, tear, he, he was not an emotional fellow. Tears came to his eyes and he said, Brother Blue, I respect you for doing this and I do forgive you. Boy, what a blessed time we had. What a good time. I had him to come back and preach for me. I helped him financially with his church. How sweet it was, how sweet it is for brethren to dwell in unity. And you know, he, he's a young guy. He died here just recently died in his sleep. I'm so glad that we got that taken care of. But you know what I could have done? I could have said, you know what? I really would like to have this restore, restoration. And when he comes, because he's wrong, you know that, don't you? I mean, all of us in this church know he was wrong. And if he would just come, but you know the Lord won't let you get off the hook like that. Do you know what he said? He said, if you go to the altar and there you remember that your brother has alt against you, Leave your sacrifice and go and be reconciled. So here's how it works. If I've offended you, if, that's a good word, if. If I've offended you, I'm sorry. Don't ever say that. But anyway, but, but if I've offended you, it is my responsibility to go to you and apologize. Right? If you've offended me, it's my responsibility to go to you and tell you. <laughs> right? So therefore, all the responsibility is on all of us. See? Here's how we get out of it. We say, it's the other person's fault. And God says, I'm not going to let you get away with that. If it is the other person's fault, you go to them and tell them. You say, well, Lord, it's my fault. Then you go to them and tell them. You understand what I'm saying here? That way, no one can alibi so that this relationship is damaged and stays that way. If somebody offends you and hurts you intentionally, you have a responsibility to go to them and tell them, you hurt me, here's what you did. If they, if they ask your forgiveness, then you forgive them. If you know you've hurt somebody, you still have a responsibility to go to them. And if you did it intentionally. Now things that, if there's no intention in, in, in hurt, there's no need for asking for forgiveness. There, it wasn't intended. See? And you don't need to hold people accountable for things they, don't intend, they didn't intend to do. See, Forgiveness has to do with knowingly uh, hurting someone and doing it intentionally. Number four, number four, uh, you have to repeat this process as long as it's necessary. And by the way, let me say that I would confess to you that I wouldn't do very well right here. I would almost, I probably would flunk the test right here. I know what's right. But man, 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 this is where the grace of God really would have to kick in, wouldn't it? Let's see. I can tell you what will make it easier. I'm going to tell you in a minute. But I used the illustration of, of Brother Hanson in his nice, nice, nice car out in the parking lot. 
and somebody backing into it out here Sunday morning and they're waiting for him and say, Brother Pete, I am so sorry. I backed into your car. Forgive me. He'll say, no problem. <laughs> You're forgiven. I have insurance. But he parks somewhere else. But next Sunday, the guy that hit him parks right by him again. Opens the door, slams into the side of his door, reconfigures it. The guy's waiting for Brother Pete when he comes out. Says, you know, I'm, I'm red-faced. I'm sorry. But I opened the door and hit your car. Ooh, me. Well, that's only twice, Pete. <laughs> well, it keeps on and keeps on, and seven times that happens. Brother Pete would probably become a Mormon. <laughs> or a murderer. You know why the Lord makes that illustration so ridiculous? It is. It's ridiculous. In fact, it goes beyond that. Peter said, how often should I forgive somebody? Seven times? Se or seven times? Now Jesus said, let's just up the ante a little bit. How about 70 times seven? Oh, my land. Could you imagine you forgiving somebody, the same guy, that many times over and over and over and over and over and over? No way, buddy. But you know what makes it easy? It's when you think about how many times you have to go. I've been saved 50 years. I wonder how many times I've had to go back and say, Sorry, Lord, I knocked the taillight out. Sorry, Lord, I just keep doing the same stupid thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over. I'm not going to bargain with you. I just want you to forgive me because I'll probably do it tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. You get it? Once you get it, it'll sure make it easier for you to forgive other people. That's the only thing I know to tell you. There's no other secret. There's no, there's no remedy. There's no key. And by the way, you know the alternative to forgiveness? Is bitterness. You either forgive people or you internalize it and become bitter. I've been on that ward. It's a horrible place to be. Because it contaminates. It's contagious. It contaminates everybody else. And some of you, you are really glossing it over because deep down you've got some bitterness that you've never resolved. You've said it like this, I'll forgive them when hell freezes over. That's a good Christian approach. See, freely you've received, freely give. When you learn to forgive people with no strings attached, God will set you free. He'll set you free. You want to be God-like? Forgive people. No strings attached. That doesn't mean that you have to reinstate people. It doesn't mean that you have to trust them. Trust has to be earned. But forgiveness does not. They're two different things altogether. And that's what confuses people. They think, you know, when you forgive, you have to forget. You can't forget. You say, but preacher, what do you do? You replace it with other thoughts. And what are those? The Word of God. You hide God's Word in your heart. You think on, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. But you know, everything that's ever happened to me in all my life... It is filed back there somewhere in the filing cabinet. And it never gets out. That's why the bad things you do and the bad things you see never disappear. And that's why you better be careful little eyes what you see. Because you don't forget it. It's in the filing cabinet. Well, what's the answer? 
The answer is not to try and forget those things. The answer is to replace them by thinking on other things. By thinking on right things. By meditating on good things. That's the only way. Young girl says, I am never going to be like my mother. I can't stand my mother. I am not going to be like my mother. Guess what? She'll turn out just like her mother. You can't be any other way because you're constantly playing that record over. Even though you think you're playing against it, you're not. You're recording it. Fellow says, I'm not going to be like my dad. Never. And he plays that over the rest of his life. Even in his 40s, he said, I'm not going to be like my dad. Guess who he's like? He's like his dad. You don't think about what you're not going to be. You don't think about those things. You replace those thoughts with God's Word. See? Does that make sense to you? All right. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so, as I said, the alternative is bitterness, and God expects you to forgive others. God's been gracious to you. The alternative is bitterness, and God expects you to do it. God expects me to forgive people, and He expects you to do the same. But you know, if you haven't been saved, if you have not experienced God's grace in your life, you probably can't forgive people. You probably don't want to. But once you get saved and understand the marvelous grace of God, how it's been extended to you personally, it makes it so much easier to forgive others. Freely you've received, freely give. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for your free mercy and grace. And God, that you have forgiven us of all of our sins. Many times we don't forgive ourselves. Many times there are others who will not forgive us. But Lord, we're thankful that you have forgiven us. And you remember them against us no more. And help us to be like you, that we might not only demonstrate the Christian life, but that we might be free in our own spirit. And so I pray this morning if there's someone here that has never really experienced the saving grace of Christ, that they will do that this morning. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, there might be someone here this morning, maybe you've been thinking about getting saved, and you've just never gotten around to it. I want to encourage you today to accept Jesus as your Savior. He died for you on the cross, paid for your sins. And if you'll trust Him as your Savior, He'll save you. And if you'd like to have Christ as your Savior, you, from your heart, you can repeat this prayer after me, and He promises you'll save, He'll save you. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe you died on the cross for me. And right now, the best I know how, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I want you to come into my heart and change me. Help me now to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. God help you. I pray that you prayed that prayer and that you trusted Him as your Savior. I want you to take that card that Pastor Murphy mentioned earlier this morning that uh, response card. I want you to look at the back of it. I want to go over it just briefly with you. If you, uh, in your heart, made a decision today to trust Christ, would you, ex would you indicate that on this? And somebody from this church will contact you and uh, help you as far as a follow-up. If you are saved and you need to get baptized uh, and you have not done that, would you indicate that? We'll be baptizing folks here in just a couple of weeks. And then, maybe you're renewing your commitment to Christ. Maybe you did that today, or you're doing it right now. And then class 101 through 401 will be taught the 6th from 3 o'clock till 7 o'clock on Sunday evening. If, you, if you're interested in being a member of Open Door Baptist Church, you need to take that class 101. If you've taken that or any of the other classes, you need to move on to the following class. If you'd like to help in the church office or you want to be a part of the children's program, you can check that. On the right-hand side, I'm interested in knowing how to accept Jesus as my Savior. Maybe it wasn't clear to you, and you need more information. We'd be glad to give that to you. You want to grow in your relationship, or you need information about this church or a small group, whatever the need, would you check that? 
If you'd like to talk with me or one of the pastors about some issues here, you can check that and someone will contact you. And then, of course, the various activities are listed here. And then if you have a prayer request, you please put that down and we will pray for you. Okay? Now, in just a minute, our ushers are going to come forward. If you're a guest here this morning, you're not expected to participate in this offering. We're just glad you came. But I would like to ask everyone to please put the response card in the offering plate as it comes your way. All right? Gentlemen, if you will come, we'll receive these, these cards and our offering. Now, let's bow in a word of prayer. Now, Lord, thank you again for your wonderful grace to us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the ability to make money to pro provide for our families and for our church. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for your wonderful grace in our life. And so I pray you'll bless this response time in Christ's name. Amen. All right, God bless you now as you get it. today. We have a, a complimentary CD for you. It's right through the double doors here in the foyer. Please pick that up. That's the sermon pastor just preached. And also there's a coupon there for a free espresso in the basement. Do hope you'll join us downstairs. We always have a good time down there. Let's stand and we'll just sing a verse of amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amazing grace on the 